In some instances, people had attacked atheists who went public in the media. When the victim went to the police station, he was treated as a suspect because of his ideas. So I believe the Egyptian context poses a lot of challenges to atheists and irreligious groups. Now, it used to be the case that promoting atheism in Egypt was a crime. But could simply not believing in God soon put you behind bars? Well, according to Dar al-Ifta, a body set up to represent Islamic legal research, Egypt has the largest number of atheists in the Arab world. And many are not happy about it. That includes Amr Hamrush, the head of parliament's religious committee. He's now proposed a plan to criminalize atheism. And the idea is backed by Egypt's highest Islamic institution. Well, to help us make sense of all of this, let's speak to Khalid Diab, who's a journalist and the author of the new book, Islam for the Politically Incorrect. Khalid, good to talk to you. Why is this a priority for Egypt's lawmakers? Well, I mean, it, it, it needn't be a priority. It's really something that's, uh, uh, that's uh, an issue of personal freedom, really. And, um, and the Egyptian constitution, in theory, protects and, and states that uh, uh, freedom of belief is absolute. So it's a kind of contradiction against uh, the very uh, uh, foundation of uh, Egyptian uh, uh, legal uh, uh, norms. Yeah, and it's really interesting. There have been some convictions, right, over the years, especially since 2013, for things like uh, contempt of religion, defaming Islam. All of them you know, rightly or wrongly, related to something that somebody did outwardly, whether it's something they said or blogged about and so on. But now we're talking about something that sounds a bit like thought crime. Are we yep. entering a reality where somebody can just rat out somebody else and accuse them of being an atheist and that's enough to maybe get somebody thrown in jail? Well, I mean, the, the troubling thing about this, uh, this proposed bill is that it, um, it will remove the legal ambiguity currently, which is currently a status quo in Egypt. At the moment in Egypt, there is no, uh, atheism is not outlawed. And in theory, according uh, uh, to, to Article 64 of uh, the Constitution, uh, freedom of belief is absolute. Uh, but there is a back door for allowing, uh, and this is where the gray era comes in, allowing uh, uh, thought, religious thought crimes in, uh, in, you know, the, the, the Egyptian uh, uh, law prohibiting the insulting or defaming of the so-called heavenly religions. So through that, so far, that, you know, uh, whether Islamists or the state, they've been able to, on a piecemeal basis, uh, uh, um, you know, um, uh, pursue and sometimes persecute individual uh, uh, atheists and non-believers. But this law is, has been used as much against believers as it has been against non-believers. You, know, uh, uh, um, you know, like uh, th there was, a, from the 90s, there was a whole series of cases against reformist Muslims and Muslims of alternative uh, ideas and ideologies mm -hmm. uh, that, uh, uh, in which, uh, you know, Islamist lawyers tried to, uh, to get uh, you know, uh, certain leading Egyptian intellectuals, for example, declared uh, uh, apostates. Hmm. This happened with uh, Nasr Hamid Abu Zaid, for example, uh, and he was actually because of this Hezbollah law, as it's called. Uh, he was f uh, the, the, the Sharia court uh, 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 declared that he had to be divorced from his wife. So he and his wife fled to Europe, and he spent many years in Europe teaching in universities there. And he was a, a believing Muslim. He was just a reformist who, who taught, you know, uh, who thought Islam had to be analyzed th through historically sound methodology and contextualized according to the that, uh, to, to the age in which it emerged, and not be seen as a timeless uh, uh, faith. There's something I want to understand when these fears and these accusations go out. We see atheism is not compartmentalized. They are connections with terrorism. They are connections with mental illness. They are connections made with even homosexuality. They're all kind of thrown in, finessed in, and stirred about, right? They're all kind of interchangeable in many ways. Tell me what's, what's behind that in Egyptian society from the perspective of the state wanting to, to prosecute this. 
Okay, from the, uh, well, yes, there's a, there's a state's perspective and there's the society's perspective or the, uh, uh, or the social perspective. But from the perspective of the state, uh, it's really had a, a Jekyll and Hyde approach to the whole issue of belief and uh, atheism uh, since the 2011 revolution. The revolution uh, uh, raised um, uh, public expectations and made, in fact, the public far more tolerant to dissent, to alternative ideas, to alternative ideologies. And actually, atheists who had gone underground in recent decades or kept to themselves suddenly began to ha have a prominent public profile. They started appearing on television talk shows, they started being interviewed, they started blogging, they started demanding rights in the Constitution. Uh, and this caused the Jekyll and Hyde issue, partly. Like, the state, on the one hand, would say, uh, uh, especially uh, Sisi, who um, you know, rose on a, uh, on a wave of anti-Muslim Brotherhood rhetoric in which he said, you know, we won't be like the Muslim Brotherhood, we want to reform Islam uh, and make it a more tolerant religion. And then, on the other hand, you know, uh, his interior ministry has been arresting uh, atheists on a piecemeal level, Al-Azhar, uh, you know, Sunni Islam's most, uh, supposedly most prestigious institution, has, uh, uh, has uh, declared a kind of war on atheism, in which, you know, uh, they, they've even set up kiosks in, uh, in metro stations and in public places to try and teach, supposedly, the right version of Islam, uh, because that, there's this conception that it's because people are turning to atheism because they don't understand Islam properly. Although yeah. for atheists like myself, it's because we understand Islam and religion all too well that we've turned away from it. Yeah, I mean, this is interesting. I mean, that, that is an interesting double standard because there, particularly Sisi is, is projected as an enlightened leader who replaced, in his opinion, a religiously fanatical Muslim brotherhood, right? And you don't see much criticism of this from, from his allies, particularly uh, in the West and so on, when they're rounding up atheists. Let me then move on to the, the issue of Egyptian society. Now, I'm not asking you to psychoanalyze, you know, tens of millions of people, but understanding a little bit about Egyptian society, it's deeply conservative, but then it's also de deeply cosmopolitan and eclectic, and there's a live and let live feeling about the Egyptian people. You've got an incredible history in the country. If yep. prosecution and persecution of atheists is a thing, would it have the will of the majority backing it? Well, that's very difficult to ascertain. I mean, it's, it's quite easy uh, in, in times of uh, rapid change and fear and paranoia and uh, insecurity to whip up the masses even in a, let, a society that is traditionally one of let live and let live. Uh, you saw that with the anti-Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, um, campaign and rhetoric following, uh, 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 you know, the, the ouster of uh, Mohammed Morsi. You know, the Muslim Brotherhood was so demonized in the media, uh, in the pro-military media, at least in the pro-state, pro-military media, and by the state itself, to such an extent that a lot of Egyptians were so fearful and distrustful of the Muslim Brotherhood that they condoned and, uh, uh, and even cheered as Muslim Brotherhood, unarmed Muslim Brotherhood members were massacred on a public square. So, you know, it depends on how the propaganda machine works against uh, atheists. If an effective propaganda machine is, whips up public fear and anxiety towards atheists, and already, you know, some people try, are trying to do that, you know, that atheists don't have a moral compass, which is nonsense. We, you know, you don't need to believe in God and be afraid of, uh, of eternal punishment in order to be a good person. On the contrary, some people who are... Uh, you know, uh, um, who are declared uh, uh, believers and pious men and women uh, are not that. And Egyptians discovered that with the rule of the Muslim Brotherhood. They thought, oh yeah, pious men will rule the country uh, well and have their hearts on the people. But th 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 that was not the case. Um, also, you know, there's whole like, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's attempts to link, but by people who are counter atheists or want to be populists. Uh, and, and whip up, uh, you know, public uh, uh, fear and, and, and support. Um, you know, they, they, they condemn atheists as Satanists. You know, there was a, a cafe that was supposedly a den of atheism. Uh, um, uh, it was called the, the Atheist Cafe that was shut down by the police last year. 
And, uh, you know, the, the, the officer in charge claimed that they had satanic symbols hung up on the walls. Um, and, uh, and the place had advertised itself as an atheist cafe, but they had satanic symbols which is complete, like, you know, I don't know, gobbledygook. You know, how many atheists are Satanists? I mean, I mean it's this idea that if you're not, right. you know, if you're well, not... If you, if you don't believe in God, uh, it's, very, it's very unlikely that you believe in the devil as well, devil, which you know? is a bit of a contradiction. Yeah, I get you. Okay, Khalid, unfortunately, exactly. I've, yes, I've, got to, I've got to move on, precisely, but it's yes. been a pleasure talking to you. Khalid Diab, I thank you very much for joining us here on the Newsmakers.